Hi, my name is Susie Regan. And can you tell me, Susie, um, can you give me some background about your uh, how you grew up and ultimately how you became involved in law enforcement? I was born uh, in New York on Long Island and um, lived there for the first 11 years of my life. I used to walk to school in the snow. I had a very sheltered uh, childhood. My mother was always afraid something bad was going to happen to me, so she would pick me up at the bus stop and walk me home and wouldn't let me cross the street by myself till I was like 10. So then um, I had a half brother who was drafted and he was in the Marine Corps and he got stationed in Pendleton. So he was the only family we had in this country. My mom was from Norway. And so we moved 3000 miles across country so we could be close to my brother. That's how I ended up in the LA area. Um, always in sports in high school, um, got bored pretty easily. So um, my dad died when I was a senior in high school. And in order for my mom to continue to collect social security, I had to be a student till I was 18, which was the only reason I was going to junior college. And I wound up taking a introduction to law enforcement class as an elective. And um, I remember sitting there in this hall, listening to this instructor thinking, I could be outside. I said, this could be kind of cool. So I got a job as what they would call a community service officer. You had to be a full-time student and it was a part-time job. It was kind of like, um, like a cross between a report car and a meter maid. You handled nothing but cold calls and you wrote parking tickets. And um, oh, I, had my little, I still have my uniform shirt with my patches. I worked for San Fernando PD uh, for four years as a civilian. And um, I still have the receipt from the uniform shop because this was like the coolest thing ever. And um, so I, I worked there as a community service officer for a couple of years, and then I was a dispatcher, and then I just started applying everywhere. And there's actually, there's a picture of me on the front page of the San Fernando local paper when LAPD lowered the height requirement, because I, I was only 5'2", and it used to be you had to be 5'6". So I can remember it before they lowered the height requirement, thinking I was so smart, I wore these big platform tennis shoes and back in the day your pants were so wide they covered your shoes and I brought an extra pair of shoes in with me thinking that they would think I was this tall because I had a pair of, and they just looked at me and said nice try <laughs> you come back when you grow another four inches so uh, once they lowered the height requirement I just applied everywhere and um, I applied in Orange County Riverside County I figured whoever picks me up first and then I can pick and choose afterwards. But I, I always wanted to work for LAPD back in the day who didn't, you know? So was the initial thought uh, in terms of going into law enforcement, just having a job that, you know, you could be out and about um, or what kind of, what kind of brought you there? C certainly. Yeah. You know, cause you have to be physically fit. You have to be active and it's, even if it's the same type of call, it's never the same call. So it's always something different. Okay. Did you ever worry about, um, the danger of the job? No. Isn't that, it's looking back, it's, it's kind of a stupid thing, but no, I, I never did. Growing up, my parents never told me I couldn't do something because I was a girl. I mean, that sentence was, was just never uttered. You want to do something? Just make sure, you know, you give it your best. Give it your all. Okay, so you start applying everywhere and ultimately you get hired by LAPD. Yes. And so what, what happens? I, it kind of explain to me the training and what you have to go through at that time. And, and what year is that, by the way? 1984. So actually I got, they had a hiring freeze because it was the Olympics. The Olympics were coming to LA. So in the interim, I got a job as a dispatcher for LAPD. because so I figured a job with the city, you know, gives you some sort of an in. So uh, for like eight months, I was a dispatcher. And then um, I started the academy the week of my birthday. And I just, you know, you're filling out all these forms and you hear all these horror stories. And I just remember thinking, please baby Jesus, don't let anybody find out today's my birthday because God only knows what kind of torture they're gonna, you know, give to me. And these were the days where, you know, it was still very paramilitary. You know, I swear the PT instructors would eat a raw onion and then come yell and scream at you. And oh, the first, the first week, second week in the academy, 
you know, we're all supposed to wear sweats, sweats with our name stenciled. Well, I'd forgotten my stencil, my uh, sweats in my car. We didn't have enough time to run down to my car before we were all out on the PT field. So I borrowed somebody else's that was, she was at light duty, so she wasn't wearing it. And I thought, oh, it's only the first week. They'll never remember who I am. Well, we, out of a class of 85, there was only like 12 females. I probably should have been smart enough to figure that out. So, and all my classmates are like, WTF, what are you doing, you know? It's, oh, it'll be fine, it'll be fine. And um, we're standing in formation and our head PT instructor, he's walking up and down and all of a sudden he stops in front of me. He looks at me, Tisdale? He says, quote unquote, did you fucking get married overnight? Sir, no, sir. Thankfully, nobody else but me got, I had to write a 500 word essay on why I impersonated another police officer. It's, oh, good Lord. Lots of ands and thes and all handwritten. <laughs> so how long was, um, how long was training for LAPD at the time? It was six months. Okay. And what did, what did it include? It was the longest six months of my life. When people would ask me, how are you doing? How's it going? I would judge how I was doing by how much time I had left. You know, two months to go or, you know, three months left. And it was, it was tough looking back, kind of like high school, you know, while you're in it, it's horrible. And then as soon as you're done with it, you're like, man, that was fun. What a good time. You know, we had to scale the wall and I'd never handled a gun before, so I had to learn how to shoot and, um, you know, pursuit driving and DTAC, you know, hands-on. It, it was the best. I loved it. What was the hardest thing for you going through the training? Staying awake in the classroom, probably. I just wanted to get out there and start doing it, you know, not understanding that you have to learn the, ba you know, and they went through the whole history of LAPD and everything. So, and they tell you the reason that the badge is oval shaped and not a star with no pointy edges so that when somebody you encounter who's bigger and badder decides they want to shove it someplace, it doesn't hurt you physically because it's rounded. Right. <laughs> so in 84, can you kind of give me a climate of how policing was in Los Angeles? Um, it was still very old school. There still weren't a lot of females. Um, I got out of the academy. I went to North Hollywood Division and um, which is close to Burbank Studios. And when I worked day shift, you know, I'd be on a traffic stop and people would stop and walk up to us and ask us if we were filming a movie. It's like, that, no, <laughs> this is real life. <laughs> did, I mean, did they, did they stop you thinking you were filming a movie because you were a female or just? Uh, I think probably because I was a female, yeah. And they just weren't really used to seeing us. You okay. know, we were kind of an oddity still at the time. Okay, so you were in North Hollywood. Can you give me an idea of what kind of uh, calls that you would work on? Well, yes, I'll tell you my very first call. I remember it like it was yesterday. I was working, um, the call signs were 15A67, which is kind of like Studio City. It's a more affluent area, and um, it's June, and LAPD standards, I'm wearing long sleeves and a tie, no sunglasses, and low-top shoes because everything is a rite of passage. You know, once you've passed a certain phase, you can wear sunglasses. Once you've passed a certain phase, you can wear short sleeves. It's all very much structured. So I'm sweating, you know, but I'm so excited. It's my first day. And um, my partner's giving me a tour of, you know, okay, this is where these famous people live here and these famous people live here. And from behind us, this car's honking. So we, we pull over and this, um, older gentleman with a stogie in like a convertible Cadillac pulls up and tells my partner, he goes, officers, officers, back there on Ponzi Street. I've just seen the most horrific thing I've ever seen. So my partner's like, well, what did you see? He goes, I can't tell you. There's a woman in your car. And then my partner's like, it's okay. She can handle it. She's pretty tough. And um, he goes, back there in the middle of the street, there's an eight foot penis. And it, we look at each other. It's like, all right. I'm like, how do I call out on that? You know, what do I say? What do I say? What's the, what's the proper verbiage here? So we turn around, we go back and it was, um, some people of an alternate lifestyle that were having a garage sale. And that was their lure to get people to come to the garage sale. 
<laughs> so I'm just like, oh my God. So the next day in roll call, you know, I'm sitting there in the front row taking notes diligently on everything. And um, they're getting ready to dismiss us. And the assistant watch commander goes, it's a tradition here at North Hollywood that, you know, probationary officers stand up, turn around and face everybody and tell us about the first call you went on. Oh, I'm thinking, oh, this is going to be great. And as I'm standing up, I'm thinking, oh, oh no. So as I stand, as I'm turning around the back two rows, how big was it? Oh, it was classic. I thought, all right, this is going to be a good job. I'm going to fit in just fine. Not sure you could do that at today's climate, but it was, it was a lot of fun then. Okay. So how does your, how does your career progress at that point with LAPD? I mean, I'm assuming at some point you get past probation. Um, what becomes, and I think part of the reason the, the, the draw of law enforcement is there is no typical call, but did you become more familiar with call, certain calls other, uh, over others? Well, sure. And it's, as soon as you get done with your probation in LA, they, it's what they call, they wheel you, they transfer you to another section of the city. So you don't become too complacent and too comfortable in one spot. So I got wheeled to downtown LA. So I walked to Footbeat for a couple of years in Skid Row. And um, I knew that I had worked there too long when I stopped washing my hands so frequently. Because dealing with all the homeless people and everything was like, ah, oh, it's fine. All their bad habits just didn't seem that bad anymore. So later on, you go to Modesto PD, and we'll, we'll get to that uh, eventually. But focusing on Skid Row... Um, have you ever had an opportunity to go back and see how it is now compared to what it was? I haven't been back to LA. I moved here eight years ago to Idaho and then I left LA in 94 and I would go back to, you know, to visit friends, but to downtown, I have, I've seen, you know, little clips on the news. It doesn't look like it's gotten any better. So do you think it's, it was as bad then as it is now? I certainly thought it was because I didn't have anything to compare it to, but um, it seems as though it has become more populated. Okay. And how about um, when you were in LA at the time when you started, what was the climate uh, in, in terms of civilians toward law enforcement? Were they happy to see you? Were they not happy to see you? I think that they're never happy to see us when they don't. We're like the American Express card. You'd rather have us and not need us than need us and not have us. You know, it's always, where were you five minutes ago kind of a thing. And I think that's true in, in both departments that I worked in, or actually all three, if you want to count my civilian time in San Fernando. Okay. Okay. So you graduate from uh, probation. How does it progress? How does your career pro Then I, I got wheeled to downtown LA, and um, where you really don't have any family calls. There was no domestic violence back in those days. And so it was a lot of, of dope calls, you know, people at rock cocaine was at the height of its glory. So we were arresting people for rock cocaine left and right. Okay. It, it was not uncommon to have like 70 arrests just for dope every month. And so a majority of those, are they just you know, normal people dealing dope, or is it, you know, obviously there's there's a big gang problem in L.A. Is Are you dealing with any gangs at that point? Not in downtown L.A. I later uh, worked South Central, and I was there for the riots, and yes, that was, you know, a whole nother ball game. Okay. <laughs> okay. So you start working, obviously, crack cocaine, start working dope in, uh, in downtown. Um, do you, how long are you there in downtown? I worked in Downtown LA for two years, a little over two years, and then I transferred to um, Plain Clothes, where I, I, um, I worked the west end of the city, like Santa Monica area, Hollywood, um, Wilshire, and um, where I was Plain Clothes trying to buy dope. Some people dirty well, and some people don't dirty well. I don't dirty well. I was not a very believable. <laughs> So I was always the uh, UCLA kid going to school. You know, I always had school books in the back of my car so that they would think I was a UCLA student because it just wasn't it wasn't a good, believable look for me. So just, just kind of explain it for, for the listeners or viewers. When you say plain clothes, what does that mean? 
um, I would be dressed just like this. Blue jeans, shorts, you know, tennis shoes, nothing police related at all. Okay. And then when you're down there to try and buy dope, are you targeting specific people or you just go down there and you're like, whoever approaches me and wants to sell dope, that's you what I'm doing. You are targeting a specific area where you know there's there has been dope sales. Okay. Okay. Um, so you work in plain clothes for how long? Uh, eight months. Okay. Uh, do you ever make detective? Is that is that a goal of yours? No. Okay. And and why not? Just curious. I I just liked pushing a black and white. I just did. I loved it. So what what uh, what drew you to the? Or I guess maybe they just assigned you to the plain clothes. Um. No, actually, I put in for it because I thought I wanted a little change of pace, and then. The deciding factor for me was it was myself and two other uh, plain clothes officers. We were in a car and I was in the passenger seat and um, had a, we had a gun pulled on us. They, were, they wanted to rob us. And um, I could see the indentation of the hollow points in the revolver. And I thought, I think I like my odds better uniform, or at least, you know, it's an even playing field. Right. So that, that was my last, um, my last hurrah. Anything interesting happen to you while you were in plain clothes? Any interesting stories? <sighs> Probably none that I should share. How's that? <laughs> okay, fair enough. Okay, so you were in um, uh, plain clothes for working dope for about six months, right? Six to eight months, yeah. Okay, and then and then what happens? Then I you transferred to uh, Southwest Division, which is in South Central LA, okay. and I was there for five years. And how was that perspective being in South Central? Um, I loved it because people didn't call until they really needed you. You know, they're not calling for the barking dog or whatever. That's some serious crimes. And like I said, that was in the heyday of all the gangs. So drive-by shootings all the time. You know, you, you actually felt like when you, when you caught somebody, you made a difference in somebody's life somewhere. Was there a typical call that you'd get in South Central? Oh, gosh. Drive-by shootings were like all the time. Okay. And that was, I'm assuming, all gang related. Yes. What were the predominant at that time? What were the predominant gangs that you had to deal with? Oh God, the Crips and the Bloods, and the north end of town would be Thirteenth um, um, Street, and then in the middle of that, all of that is USC campus. So you've got you know these beautiful coeds from all over, you know, jogging in sports bras, and it's like, really, what are you doing? <laughs> And then that's when the Raiders were playing at the Coliseum. So you've got the Raiders football games on Sundays, and then you've got USC football games on Saturdays. So it was quite a large variety. Okay. Um, obviously, we're old enough to kind of remember the movie Colors uh, with Robert Duvall. How, how realistic was that movie? Pretty accurate, actually, you know, as far as, as that goes. Um, the area that I worked, did you ever see the movie Training Day with Denzel Washington? Yep. If you remember that area that they drove to with all the, what they call projects, that was in Southwest. That was the division that I worked. Hmm. Okay. Any, um, any scary or interesting stories that happened to you while you were in South Central? Well, I was there for the riots, so it was two weeks of interesting you know, and, and how was that as a, as a police officer during the riots? What, give me your perspective. It was, it was unbelievable. It was, it was like you were driving and it just was surreal. It felt like you were in the, a backdrop of a movie. Mm. Although had anybody talked to everyone that was in patrol, we knew that was going to happen. Wh wh why? Because we, we, we could just tell the climate of the community. They were angry. And what was what was the driving thing? Was there one specific incident, or was, or was this just kind of building up? Well, I think you know the jury in Simi Valley obviously finding the four officers not guilty. That was just that was the last straw. I remember at the time I had a um, a charcoal gray pickup truck parked in the back lot, and they held us all over. So we were there for almost twenty four hours, and when I came out to my truck. I couldn't see it because there was so much soot and it was the same color. It, yeah, it was crazy. Hmm. Now, I heard a story, and maybe you can confirm this, and I don't know whether it's, you know, just a story. But I heard when they started the riots there, 
USC, because they're right in the middle of there, but because they actually employed so many people from that neighborhood, people from the neighborhood actually went to the campus on USC and prevented the campus from being destroyed. Is that true? Did you hear anything like that? I never heard that, but it wouldn't surprise me. Okay. You know, we were, obviously, we were so busy. We were just inundated. It was the only time where um, we just, we, we didn't respond to any calls because we couldn't. I mean, there were stories, you know, of people that were killed that they just put toe tags and, you know, sent them off. This is where this happened. Hmm. It, it was, it was a remark remarkable time for sure. So when you say that basically you, you didn't get sent out, what was, what was your job at the time then during those riots? Well, we were, we kept waiting for direction. Um, there was a command post. That's where all of the, um, the captains and whoever, the higher ups, they went to brainstorm whatever it was they were supposed to be doing. So I was the acting watch commander. So my job was to call everybody in. Hey, you know, get your butt to work. Your vacation's canceled or whatever, you know, get here as quickly as you can and as safely as you can. After the, after the first night, a bunch of us met at my house and we carpooled. There were like four of us that carpooled together, you know, shot everyone's own shotguns and whatever out the windows. And as soon as we get off the freeway, we just made a beeline for the station. Mm. And so once you got to the station, was there, did they call you out to like, you know, support the fire department or what was, what was your main job at that point? The SWAT guys did that because there was a fire captain who was shot in the neck and didn't kill him, but he was, you know, obviously gravely injured. And that was right around the corner from the station that I worked at. Mm. So yeah, the, um, I think that's when the fire department started going to bulletproof vests. And like on New Year's Eve, the SWAT units would escort the different uh, fire engines on any calls that they went on. So I'd never heard that before. So the fire department, I I'm assuming the fire department doesn't wear bulletproof vests these days. Or do they? I'll bet you they do. They if do. they're going to a shooting call, yeah, okay. absolutely. Okay. And you think that that kind of started during those riots? Then? Yes. Interesting. Okay. Okay. So the riots at some point kind of subside. Then where does your career take you from there? Um, I had a little uh, personality conflict with um, one of my captains. So I decided that probably wasn't a good idea for me to stay in South Central, so I transferred up to Van Nuys Division. And then um, there was a lot of internal turmoil at the time, right after the riots. And I remember thinking, I can't do another 20 years here. This will, this will eat me alive. So um, my partner at the time, he was from Modesto. He says, hey, a bunch of us, let's go up and let's just, just check it out. And uh, it was the weirdest thing. I just got out and kind of looked around and I thought, I could live here. This is kind of a cool place. It was kind of a sleepy hollow. And I, I lateraled up there and um, within, I would say within two years, everything flipped around and um, was that housing, housing went through the roof in the Bay Area. So people were selling their homes in the Bay Area and paying cash for a house in Modesto but then not have enough money for furniture. So it, all the, um, the less desirable people from the Bay Area all moved to Modesto. So this nice little sleepy town became just like where I came from. Okay, so and I think you said you started, well, you didn't say, but you told me you started in Modesto in 1994. 94, yes. And so before we get on to kind of what happened in Modesto and your career in Modesto, and, and this goes... I want to ask you about both LAPD and Modesto. California is pretty progressive. Um, I've spoken to a couple other female officers. Did you ever did you ever run into any issues at all um, being at LAPD or Modesto, uh, being a female at all? Um, as far as well, did anybody? I mean, was there any? I mean, for lack of a better term, did you ever feel like there was any chauvinism or uh, the guys got treated better than you? Or, or again, 
California is a pretty progressive state, and maybe you didn't have any of that. Just curious. Oh yeah, I think so. <laughs> that's just, that's probably a safe, honest answer. Um, when I was in LA, and this is just because I'm a female, one of my training officers for Christmas gave me um, a negligee from Fredericks. Just because? For Christmas. It was a Christmas present. Okay. So it was one of those things, and of course he says, you know, don't open this here, you know, wait till you get home. And um, so I opened the, the box and I was like, this doesn't happen to people in real life. This happens. This is like a movie, right? It's like an ABC movie of the week or something. It's like, how, how, do, I, how do I handle this? You know? Because if I, if I say something or if I don't say anything, what if he gives me a bad rating? And then they're going to say, well, I just said something because he gave me a bad rating. You know, it was, it was um, I handled it and I went to a lieutenant that I thought I could trust and said, I'm going to let you know that something's happened, but I need to trust you that I'm going to handle this on my own. And he's like, no. I said, all right, then I won't tell you. He goes, get your ass back here. And um, he told, I told him and he was just like, oh, my God. I said, I want to handle it. Let me, and, you know, I, um, went, the next time I worked with this guy, I gave it back to him. I said, you know, I appreciate the fact that you thought about getting me something for Christmas. I said, under the circumstances, this is probably something that's better suited to give to your wife. So do you think he was trying to hit on you or did you think it was just a, I think a he thought he idea. had a 50-50 shot. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> to be honest. Okay. All right. But um, he, he said, okay. Never mentioned it again. Turned out to be a great partner. Hmm. But it certainly could have went a whole bunch of different ways. Just remember thinking, this is not happening. <laughs> How about, um, you know, you said you're 5'2". And you never really thought about this. And I'm assuming maybe you thought about it once you started the job. But was there any concern uh, of personal safety being 5'2 out on the job and maybe having to deal with some gang members or larger larger people no I never did I think it's I think it's all in your attitude you know and I don't have a problem looking at somebody in the eyes and telling them yeah you're bigger than me and you may get the first lick in but I got a thousand of my best friends that I can have here in a matter of minutes yeah so do you think um, and I certainly believe this but being a female does it give you a different perspective in dealing with people or how you interact with people yeah I, th I think that they expect you to be you know the weaker sex or more compassionate about certain things i don't possess that coddling gene it's not in my dna so um they might have been in for a surprise but uh, i think it it all comes down to how you conduct yourself and you know your presence you know, if you walk in, you know, kind of hunched over and, you know, look down, well, yeah, someone's going to walk all over you. But that's true in life in any job. You know, if you give somebody and give somebody a handshake like you mean it and um, look at people. And I, I just think it gives a different perspective, okay. a different aura. Okay. So you start with the Modesto PD, uh, 94. Tell me, is there any difference between what you're doing in Modesto than what you were doing in L.A.? Night and day. Really? And Night in, and day. In what way? Just, um, especially when I started, it was a much slower department. I remember I was, they have to, you have to go with a training officer for at least a couple weeks just to get used to the different policies. I remember going to a neighbor dispute with this training officer of mine, and he's like, well, how would you have handled this in L.A.? said, I don't think I ever went to a neighbor dispute. <laughs> so we would just wait till they escalate and somebody shoots somebody and then we go. You know, it's just, it's like, I, I've never handled a neighbor, you know, just a plain old, like, barking dog or whatever. It w was just not that common. Hmm. Any interesting stories in Modesto? Oh, I'm sure there were. We worked one-man cars, so it was, you know, a much different way of doing work, you know. So let me ask you about that. So in, in an LAPD... You were always in a two-man car? Unless you worked what they call a report car, which is where you just handle nothing but cold calls. Yeah, you're always in two. 
I don't know if that's still the case, but that's how it was when I was there. So what was the reasoning for a one-man car in Modesto versus LAPD? Is it just uh, less officers, or do they have a different policing philosophy? Um, I'm sure um, the danger level and just less officers. You know, you can cover more ground. Hmm. Or at least you had the appearance of covering more ground. Did you notice, I mean, obviously, uh, for the listeners, for the viewers, I mean, I think we, you had mentioned you spent over 35 years in law enforcement? 31. 31. Close enough. Over 30. Okay, Okay. (laughs) over 30. So during that time, did you notice a change in attitude in society toward um toward law enforcement did you ever see that or for example has it gotten worse toward the from the very beginning when you started with lapd toward when you retired with modesto did that relationship between you and uh, the people you interacted with did it get worse i think so yes i think people became more entitled they felt like they had the right to question you okay it's like i'm in the middle of something now i'm happy to answer your questions I need to deal with this, and then I can come back to you. But they wanted answers like right away. It's like I, I don't have time right now. Was it a generational thing? You think was it? It could very well be. Yes. Hmm. Okay. And how about over time? Uh, you know, didn't ask any anything uh, personally about your uh, personal life, but did the did being a, a law enforcement officer affect uh, your family at all? Um, well. When I first started, my mom would always ask me, oh, you know, can you tell me a story? No, I'm not, mom, I'm not telling you any stories. <laughs> and then I can, I can remember, you know, as I had more time on the job, people would say, hey, remember, tell me that story again about, you know, da, 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 da. And I'm like, I, I don't know what you're talking about. I, you just, sadly, you can't remember. It was probably a great story. I wish I had taken the time to write down the funny stories. Right. You know, sadly, you remember the bad stories like they were yesterday, but, you know, the funny ones. How about your how about your views on how the job affected you personally and how you interact with people out in society? Did, did you, do you think it changed? Oh, absolutely. I was what we used to call white boy on white bread when I started. You know, my eyes were big like saucers every day. I grew up in a very white neighborhood. I think there was only maybe 10 Hispanic kids in the whole school. There was one black kid. I mean, very white. To go from that to working, you know, in L.A., it was just like, oh, my gosh. Wow. I, uh, I took, before I got hired by L.A., I was testing for LASO, and I made it to my oral, and the two deputies were asking me um, situational questions, and they said, you and your partner driving through the projects, your partner uh, throws the car in park and he gets out and he runs. What are you going to do? And I just, I just sat there looking at them. And they're like, do you have a problem with the question? And I'm like, what are projects? You could, they looked at each other and you could just see them going, all right, thanks. Thanks, Miss Regan. <laughs> I'd never heard of them. I had no idea what they were. Yeah. So, I mean, that was my upbringing. But do you, I guess here's, here's, Trying to elaborate a little bit on my question. When you came in, you know, a lot of a lot of police officers come in. They have this kind of fresh view on how they deal with people, um, and then some guys get really jaded toward the end of their career and how they deal with the public. And some people don't. How, how do you do? You have any opinion on that? I would like to think that I treated everyone fairly. I allowed. I allowed them to a point to dictate how the call was going to go. You know, I think my approach was always, you know, hi, how you doing? You called the police. What can I do for you? And then, you know, well, it's about time. You know, you know, you know, what took you so long to get here? Or, you know, been waiting for hours. I'm here now. How can I help you? I think in the beginning of your career, you're not able to differentiate. You think everybody's a bad guy. And I think as you get more time on, maybe comes with age comes a little bit of wisdom. Not everybody's a bad guy. Not everybody that you deal with is a bad guy. Certainly giving them, not necessarily the, um, the benefit of the doubt, but letting them, 
let's see a little more what's what's what, you know? Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So we I want to get back to the female question for a second. Do you did you ever notice and did you do you think this is true that when you would show up to a call, do you think the people that were calling you maybe were a little bit softer on you or had a different attitude when a female police officer arrived as opposed to a male officer? Like, you know, maybe a male officer shows up and they're just going to rip him a new one. Whereas you show up and they're like, oh, okay. Did you ever get that feeling? Or, you know, like, nah, they uh, they didn't care. They We were police and police were police. I think if anything, they probably thought the opposite. They probably thought, oh, crap, it's a female. You know, what are they going to do? Kind of a thing. Hmm. Especially because there were times where there were two of us that were females. I had um, I worked a gang unit for just a short time, and she's still a good friend of mine. Same height, we're both blonde. They used to call us the twins. And other than we wore the same clothes and had blonde hair, we looked nothing alike. But then, are you two twins? Uh, no, we're not twins. <laughs> So when you worked in the gang unit, was that Modesto or LAPD? LAPD. And what did you what did you do in the gang unit? Um, just went out and looked for for bad guys. Okay. Was it was it uh, stop and identify? And yeah. Get them all. Okay. Yes. Okay. Over time, over your career, uh, thirty plus years, have you noticed a difference between uh, when you started with law enforcement, the, either training, recruits coming in? Um, different attitudes on policing, and, and I'm sure there was a difference between LAPD and Modesto, but did you notice any difference between that span of your career? I think when I started, we were still the generation that kind of grew up with Adam-12. You know, we grew up wanting to be cops. It's like, what a great job. You know, and I was a little later on, but still, you know, I was at least five years. It's like, God, I can't wait to do this. And nowadays, I think, that's oh, a job. You know, until something better comes along. It's a paycheck. And that, uh, that you think that's the younger generation feels Absolutely, that way? Absolutely, yeah. So it's not so much of a calling than just a... No, and they all want to, they want to, boom, to start out at, at CSI. Well, it doesn't work that way. You know, you have to start at the bottom and work your way up. Nobody goes right into detectives or nobody goes right into to all that stuff. Do you think that attitude about this being more of a job than a career hurts law enforcement in general? Absolutely. Because okay. it's not the best paid. The hours aren't great. You're not working Monday through Friday, 8 to 5. You work weekends. You work holidays. You work graveyard. It's tough. It's, you know, the hours are tough. But, you know, like you and I were talking about before we began, I mean, the attitude is, at least back then, was, I'd do this job for free. Absolutely. I would have the first five years. I remember every two weeks, are you giving me a paycheck? Really? Woohoo! It's like an extra bonus. <laughs> do, you, do you have any, for somebody that's watching this, that may go in or may is thinking about a career in law enforcement, do you have any advice for those people? You should have been born 20 years ago. <laughs> Um, it was. It, I'm sure it's still a great job, and I think each generation says, you know, the academy was never harder than it was when I went through, or you know, it wasn't as much fun as when I was on the job. And I'm sure the guys that are on now think the same thing. So I think it's it's cyclical. I think, and certainly this part of the country are so pro police. You know, you rarely hear anything bad. You know. People wave to the police with all five fingers here all the time. It wasn't always the case in California. Yeah. So, what do you think? What do you think changed about the kind of the attitude towards police? You mean for the worse? Yeah. Um, I think going back, everyone's just so entitled. You know, a lot of times we don't have time to stop and tell you what we're doing right now. You know, we're we're in the middle of something that needs to be addressed. You know, I. And you can't question, if I'm, if I've got my gun pulled on you and I'm telling you to, you know, put your hands up, that's not the time to question me. <laughs> and it's still until the day I retired, how does somebody backtalk you when you have a gun pointed at them? 
it used to mystify me. And did you notice any, was that just kind of the younger generation in general? Absolutely, yes. Okay. Now, Susie, you might not know this. Uh, so you spent most of your time on the West Coast, and I always kind of wondered this. Um, and maybe, again, maybe you don't know the answer to this question, but did you ever have interaction with police officers for, officers from the uh, East Coast and see a difference between what they were doing, their policing, their attitudes, East Coast versus West Coast. Yes, I, like night and day, I think, difference. I was part of um, Modesto Police Department's Honor Guard, and a couple of times we went back to Washington, D.C. for the um, police memorial. You know, when we had officers from our department whose names were put up on the wall. But I think, for the most part, the East Coast is so steeped in history and tradition, where I think the West Coast, we don't have that much history in comparison, but I think we're a little more tactically superior. I could be wrong, but um, I think we're a little more current, where they're a little more still old school. Okay. So do you think that that steeped in tradition maybe isn't as progressive as what you were seeing on the West Coast? Could It could be. And I could be completely off base. Sure. This And like I said, I've never worked back there. But just talking to some of the people and, and just seeing, I guess there are different attitudes. Plus, you know, we're so sprawled out in comparison to they're right on top of each other. I, I would think that that would have to lend itself to, to some difference in yeah. work. Okay. So just, just curious, uh, you live in California, you worked there for 30 years, what, uh, what brought you to Idaho? I wasn't going to retire and live in California, it just wasn't going to happen. My happily ever after was not going to be there. Okay. As much as I miss my friends, that's what they make planes for. Okay. Susie, I really appreciate you chatting with me. Thank you very oh, much. My pleasure. Thank you.